Today we examine the second chapter of Joel, wherein he predicts a cleansing of the land of Israel by fire. He describes the fire as armies that never break ranks, purging the entire nation except Jerusalem. The fire will hop over mountains and walls and burn everything in its path leaving nothing but ashes. The fire will enter everyone's house, and no house will be spared the fire. When the shofar is blown, and the assembly is called, Joel warns them not to hesitate to leave home immediately. Come to the holy mountain, because the day of the Lord is coming with fire and burning. Those who take action will be saved. Earlier in the chapter 1, Joel predicts a locust plague which will become the prelude to the beginning of the day of the Lord. Four different species of insects will eat all the plants and the food. The drunkards mourn because they have nothing to drink. The farmers mourn because they have no crops to sell. The priests mourn because they have no grain or drink to offer the Lord. The bridegroom and the bride mourn presumably because they have nothing to offer wedding guests. Without food, all civic and religious life comes to a halt. What is left to be done except to gather in Jerusalem and pray for deliverance. Blow a trumpet in Zion and sound an alarm on my holy mountain. Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble, for the day of the Lord is coming. Surely it is near, a day of darkness and gloom, a day of clouds and thick darkness. As the dawn is spread over the mountains, so there is a great and mighty people. There has never been anything like it, nor will there be again after it, to the years of many generations. To those living at that time, the word of Joel, the son of Pethuel, will seem like a childhood memory, very distant, very far away, and hard to place. Those who remember his words will be fortunate because when they hear the call, they will remember Joel's exhortation to tabernacle in Jerusalem and leave home. Those who tabernacle with the Lord will be very fortunate indeed because something is about to take place, like the sun spreading out over the mountains at dawn. The breaking day will be a day of darkness and gloom. There has never been anything like it, nor will there ever be again after it. Zechariah pictured a flying scroll moving from house to house. Joel pictures a great and mighty people with the supernatural ability to leap over mountains, and they have the appearance of horses. Residents of Israel will see them, and they will be terrified, and this mighty army of God will be responsible for the incineration of everything, except perhaps the cattle. A fire consumes before them, and behind them a flame burns. The land is like the Garden of Eden before them, but a desolate wilderness behind them, and nothing at all escapes them. Their appearance is like the appearance of horses, and like war horses, so they run. With the noise as of chariots, they leap on the tops of the mountains, like the crackling of a flame of fire consuming the stubble, like a mighty people arranged for battle. Before them the people are in anguish, all faces turn pale. They run like mighty men, they climb the wall like soldiers, and they each march in line. Nor do they deviate from their paths, they do not crowd each other, they march every one in his path. When they burst through the defenses, they do not break ranks, they rush on the city, they run on the wall, they climb into the houses, they enter through the windows like a thief. Before them the earth quakes, the heavens tremble, the sun and the moon grow dark, and the stars lose their brightness. The Lord utters his voice before his army. Surely his camp is very great, for strong is he who carries out his word. The day of the Lord is indeed great and very awesome, and who can endure it? Joel's imagery is different than Zechariah's, but the effect is still the same. The meaning of Joel's extensive description is to highlight the totality of the destruction. 
The imagery of soldiers never breaking ranks strongly implies that nothing or no one will escape the burning fires. Walls won't stop them. Doors won't stop them. Windows won't stop them. They leap over mountains. They rush into cities and they climb into houses. Nothing remains untouched by the fire. The only way to avoid being killed is to not be there in the first place. Yet even now, declares the Lord, return to me with all your heart, and with fasting, weeping, and mourning, and rend your heart and not your garments. Now return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger, abounding in loving kindness, and relenting of evil. Who knows whether he will not turn and relent and leave a blessing behind him, even a grain offering and a drink offering, for the Lord your God. In Exodus, Yahweh declares himself to Moses, saying, The Lord, the Lord God, compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, and abounding in loving kindness and truth. That is, while he will not leave his people unpunished, there will always be time to repent until that happens. And pleas for clemency should always remain on the basis of Yahweh's commitment to his promises and his covenants. Joel's exhortation to repent is always appropriate at any time. We should always turn to God with all of our heart, with fasting and weeping and mourning. But especially as the day of the Lord approaches, it will be doubly important for God's people to make their contrition real, offering God their whole heart. On that day they will blow the shofar in Zion, and those who come to Jerusalem and survive the fire will be considered holy. He will consecrate them, and he will listen to their prayers, and he will deliver them. Blow a trumpet in Zion, consecrate a fast, proclaim a solemn assembly, gather the people, sanctify the congregation, assemble the elders, gather the children and the nursing infants, let the bridegroom come out of his room and the bride out of her bridal chamber. Let the priests, the Lord's ministers, weep between the porch and the altar, and let them say, Spare your people, O Lord, and do not make your inheritance a reproach, a byword among the nations. Why should they among the peoples say, Where is their God? Joel lays out the terms of deliverance in view of the possibility that God may relent. Those who fear the Lord must gather and assemble in Jerusalem, and once there, the priests will blow the shofar. They will consecrate a fast and proclaim a solemn assembly. I find the presence of Gentiles on this occasion to be interesting. Joel pictures his kinsmen, the Hebrew people, standing among the Gentiles as the Gentiles mock them, saying, where is your God now, eh? And so, just as the Lord said to Moses, the central issue of the Hebrew petition to Yahweh is an appeal to God's commitment to his covenant with Abraham. Yahweh should spare his people because the Gentiles are standing here mocking them, calling into question Yahweh's ability to keep and protect his people. Then the Lord will be zealous for his land and will have pity on his people. The Lord will answer and say to his people, Behold, I am going to send you grain, new wine and oil, and you will be satisfied in full with them, and I will never again make you a reproach among the nations, but I will remove the northern army far from you, and I will drive it into a parched and desolate land, and its vanguard into the eastern sea, and its rearguard into the western sea. And its stench will arise, and its foul smell will come up, for it has done great things. We see the presence of Gentiles in the city of Jerusalem, and they are mocking the Hebrew people, saying, Where is their God? In this context, the Lord promises to remove the northern army from Israel. Is this the same army that burned the land and set the houses of Israel ablaze? I don't think so. This seems like a different army. In chapter 3, the Lord announces that he will gather all the nations and bring them down to the valley of Jehoshaphat, and he will enter into judgment with them there. Here, Joel seems to hint about the battle of Armageddon. The northern armies will see that Israel has become a parched and desolate land. 
they will also see that the survivors of Israel have gathered in Jerusalem and they are in no shape to muster a defense, having become a city of starving refugees. But, Joel says, the Lord will defeat the northern armies, driving its vanguard into the eastern sea and its rear guard into the western sea. And the smell of the dead corpses will rise up a foul smell. Do not fear, O land. Rejoice and be glad, for the Lord has done great things. Do not fear, beasts of the field, for the pastures of the wilderness have turned green, for the tree has borne its fruit. The fig tree and the vine have yielded in full. So rejoice, O sons of Zion, and be glad in the Lord your God, for he has given you the early rain for your vindication, and he has poured down for you the rain, the early and latter rain as before. The threshing floors will be full of grain, and the vats will overflow with the new wine and oil. Then I will make up to you for the years that the swarming locust has eaten, the creeping locust, the stripping locust, and the gnawing locust, my great army which I sent among you. You will have plenty to eat and be satisfied, and praise the name of the Lord your God, who has dealt wondrously with you. Then my people will never be put to shame. Thus you will know that I am in the midst of Israel, and that I am the Lord your God, and there is no other, and my people will never be put to shame. Joel compares the northern army with the Lord. He mentions that the northern army has done great things, but the Lord has done great things also. The Lord promises healing and restoration, speaking to both land and beast asking them not to fear because both will be restored and refreshed, just as both the fields and the wilderness will bloom to the fullest. The Lord will send his people grain, new wine, and oil, and they will be satisfied. The most salient point here in this passage, however, is God's promise that his people will never be put to shame. The mocking will cease and there won't be anyone left to mock them. It will come about after this that I will pour out my Spirit on all mankind, and your sons and your daughters will prophesy, your old men will dream dreams, your young men will see visions. Even on the male and female servants I will pour out my Spirit in those days. I will display wonders in the sky and on the earth, blood, fire, and columns of smoke. The sun will be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes, and it will come about that whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be delivered. For on Mount Zion and in Jerusalem there will be those who escape, as the Lord has said, even among the survivors whom the Lord calls. What does he mean after this? After what? I think the indicated aforementioned events are the locust plague and the army of fire starters. He just mentioned the years of the locusts that ate up all the food and every green plant in the nation. And after this, once those who fear the Lord have been gathered in Jerusalem, at that time the Lord will pour out His Spirit on them all. Something very similar to this took place at Pentecost, just as Peter has said. He and his fellow apostles didn't experience blood and fire and columns of smoke, but they did experience the outpouring of the Spirit. And eventually we learn that the Lord uses an outpouring of His Spirit as evidence that He has consecrated someone. For example, the Lord poured out His Spirit on Cornelius and his household, and in that context the Lord says to Peter, What God has cleansed no longer consider unholy. Therefore the signal event which proves that God has consecrated someone is the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. In Joel 2.1 and again in 3.17, God refers to Zion as his holy mountain. Here we learn that God himself will sanctify his people in Zion. As it says in Isaiah, it will come about that he who is left in Zion and remains in Jerusalem will be called holy. And it bears repeating, he who is left in Zion and remains in Jerusalem will be called holy. Now the Lord says that although he will bring fire and smoke, etc., those who call upon the Lord will be saved. Paul the Apostle argues from this verse that God is saving all kinds of people regardless of race, gender, or socioeconomic status. 
God is saving all those who call upon his name, no matter where they live and no matter where they call. Those whom God is saving can call upon his name from anywhere in the world, even privately in their own prayer closet. But in this context, calling on the name of the Lord not only brings about forgiveness and eternal life, it means literal, actual rescue from death. Coming to Jerusalem at that time will be an act of faith, and those who heed the call will remain alive rather than be killed. Those who call upon the name of the Lord will live in every sense of the word. From our text, we learn that Joel's predictions share themes in common with Malachi's predictions, namely burning, healing, repentance, and judgment. Malachi says that the arrogant evildoers will be incinerated and become ashes under the soles of the feet who fear the Lord. Joel predicts that the Lord will send fire in the form of supernatural armies that can leap over mountains and never break ranks. Malachi predicts that a son of righteousness will rise with healing in its wings, and Joel predicts that God will reverse the fortunes of his people and consecrate them with the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Malachi predicts that the Lord will send Elijah the prophet to turn the hearts of the children toward the fathers, and here in Joel, the people mourn and come to Jerusalem to collectively pray for deliverance. And finally, Malachi predicts that God will judge the arrogant evildoers, leaving them without any progeny or heirs. And here in Joel, the sunrise will see the dawning of a mighty army of fire that will purge the land of Israel from her evildoers. As Isaiah says, from that moment forward, the branch of the Lord, which is Jesus Christ, will be the pride and adornment of the survivors of Israel. Those who came to Zion to call upon the name of the Lord will be called holy, and these people will be recorded for life in Jerusalem. The Lord will wash away the filth of the daughters of Zion and purge the bloodshed of Jerusalem from her midst through a spirit of judgment and a spirit of burning. My hope is that some who watch this video will call upon the name of the Lord and make the trip to Jerusalem when the time comes. Remember the words of Bob Dylan, Let us not speak falsely now. The time is getting late. I hope you enjoyed this video and found it helpful to your own studies. If you did, please share this video with others and especially those living in Israel. Also, please click thumbs up and subscribe. Thank you for watching. That's enough. Put down the mic.